Hello everybody, today I am driving this, the Ferrari 488 GTB. And as daft as it might seem to say, about a near 700 horsepower mid-engined V8 twin turbocharged supercar. But the 488 feels like something that's almost already forgotten. And when you consider it's essentially only one generation old, that just shouldn't be the case. Perhaps that's partly because the 488 had the unenviable and near impossible task of following on from the 458, easily one of Marinello's greatest hits of the last two decades. Perhaps it's because in the short time since this car's launch, we've seen a glut of new models, including its short-lived successor, the F8 Tributo, then the all-new 296 GTB, and the likes of the SF90, to say nothing of things like the Roma. On top of that, the supercar segment has rarely felt quite so busy, because this car is facing not just traditional rivals in the form of Lamborghini, but now also the likes of the Maserati MC20, which surely is a competitor for anyone thinking of buying one of these. You've also got a range of different McLarens, and if you're willing to be a little bit different, even the Honda NSX. <laughs> So today I'm going to be driving the 488 for what feels like the first time, though it isn't, and evaluating not just whether this is a good car in its own right, but whether it could possibly be the best value Ferrari supercar on sale and potentially superior in all aspects to the 458. This might get controversial. Enjoy. <laughs> was launched in 2015 and the chassis underpinning this car is essentially the same as that in the 458 however just about everything was new or improved so to talk you through the many changes I'm going to hand you over to voiceover JM with any Ferrari the engine is always a big deal and for the 488 it was also the most controversial part of the package until this point, the entry-level Ferrari had always been powered by a naturally aspirated V8, beginning with the 308 way back in 1975. But for the 488, we saw the first mid-engine turbocharged car from Marinello since the F40. Whatever the reasoning, be it emissions or keeping up with their new rivals from Woking, the new engine was a typical Ferrari tour de force. We had already been given a preview of it the year before, in the California T, but make no mistake, the engine in the 488 was significantly different. Though technically both are a 3.9, the 488 is actually slightly larger, by 47cc. In fact, the name of the 488 marked a return to an old convention, where the model referred to the cubic capacity of an individual cylinder. Naturally, the addition of turbos also made the 488 considerably more potent than its predecessor. The California T already made 560 PS, almost the same as the 4.5 litre naturally aspirated engine in the 458. The 488, though, made 110 more, for a grand total of 670 PS, more even than the Enzo hypercar of the previous decade. 0-62 was now achieved in just 3 seconds flat. Torque was also impressive, 561 pound foot or 760 newton meters, more even than in the 6.3 litre flagship V12 F12 Berlinetta. Crucially though, both of these numbers were also bigger than those produced by McLaren 650S, although that car countered by having a more advanced and lightweight carbon fibre architecture versus the aluminium underpinnings of the Ferrari. However, in spite of impressive headline figures, a great effort was made by the firm to underline the advances in turbo response times and the accessibility of the performance. That headline torque figure was available only in 7th gear, and the car is programmed to deliver the power in a fashion closer to that of a naturally aspirated lump. In the first three gears, peak torque is set to arrive at 6,250 rpm. Ferrari's press releases are always filled with geeky details, and the 488's is no different. The turbos are twin scroll items, mounted on ball bearing shafts and featuring compressor wheels made out of low density titanium aluminium. A special seal on the housing ensures that there are minimal gaps, increasing efficiency and reducing lag. The company is also always keen to push the link between its road cars and Formula One, and this is often most obvious when looking at their aerodynamics. The 488's front end is distinctly different from that on the 458. 
Gone are the deformable splitter, and in its place a new arrangement with twin supports in the middle that echo the look of an old-school single-seater and clearly drew inspiration from the then-new LaFerrari. The bonnet has two sculpted sections helping move air over the car, and the underside features vortex generators with a prominent diffuser at the rear featuring an active flap. In keeping with Ferrari's disdain for obvious spoilers, the 488 instead channels air to the back via a cutout in the bodywork, creating effectively a blown spoiler. The net result? 50% more downforce than the 458 and less drag. It is inside where the car seems closest to its predecessor, and features essentially a revised but fundamentally similar architecture. As before, there is just one gearbox, a 7-speed DCT, but fitted with new ratios and revisions also made to the car's many traction and stability control systems. Active dampers were standard. Despite sharing effectively the same chassis, the chief difference being a new rear subframe, the 488 is instantly recognisable from the side due to its prominent intakes, which the 458 lacked. These are cut in two, with the top half feeding the engine and the bottom half the intercoolers. So then, as is Ferrari tradition, a lot had changed for the 488 compared with its predecessor, but were they changes for the better? Well, I have to say, after only a few hundred yards behind the wheel of the 488, I think in just about every aspect this really is the superior car. So let's break it down because I suspect a lot of you out there are currently very keen to disagree with me. I may as well begin with the most controversial aspect, the engine. I know many of you, and to be honest, myself to some extent, were very, very upset about Ferrari abandoning the glorious naturally aspirated V8, which in the 458 was just about as good as it got. The only things I can think which were genuinely better would be a Ferrari V12. However, that was never going to find its way into the back of this. So, what we have instead is a turbocharged engine that for me really showed the competition how it was done. McLaren had already been turbocharging their cars for quite some time, and in many ways you could call those the more effective power plants. They were certainly not lacking for pace. In the 650 you had nearly the same power as this, and the slightly later 720 quite a bit more. Combine that with the fact those were considerably lighter cars. In the real world, between 100 and 150 kilos so, but this just delivers its performance more readily, more keenly, and it genuinely does a brilliant job of emulating a naturally aspirated lump. You see, once you've got to even about 2,000 RPM in this car, and there really is just about no perceptible turbo lag, and I know many, many manufacturers have claimed that, but I believe almost none of them. Ferrari, though, and they do love to chuck many different terms at their audience when they're selling these things, actually nailed it. This engine is an absolute masterpiece. It doesn't rev quite as high as the old 458. In fact, it doesn't even go as high as the McLarens, but it doesn't need to. It gets started so much earlier. I'm at 2,000 RPM now in sixth. Put your foot down and the thing just picks up and goes. Were you in a 650 or even a 720, you'd still be somewhere back there. I don't know, many people wouldn't care about that, and you'd rightly say, well, just change down a couple of gears and you'll go. But the fact is, this engine is a towering achievement. It is absolutely stunning. And, and this is possibly even more controversial, I think it actually sounds a little bit better than the 458 too. Now, this comes with a, a big asterisk and a caveat that uh, if you put some nice pipes on a 458, there is just about nothing else on this planet that sounds quite as good, save again for a Ferrari V12. However, as standard, the 458 just really makes a racket. This is, sure, a little bit muted. The edge has been taken off of it, courtesy of those turbochargers, but it is a little bit more tuneful, a little bit more soulful. As we were doing our drive-bys earlier, you could hear the car going through the rev range. It sounded genuinely different, and most importantly, it still sounds like a Ferrari. McLaren, for whatever reason, never had quite the same success at making their cars sound good, and I think that's an element of a supercar that just cannot be ignored, particularly when it comes to things like the F8, which then had a petrol particulate filter, no fault of Ferraris, and the MC20, which was then a V6 with turbos and a particulate filter, 
They just, they just don't sound like a supercar, and that to me means a huge part of the experience is simply absent. And I'm sure there are people out there who'd happily trade a little bit of noise for a few extra tenths on the drag strip, but I'd wager most of those people are either American or 12. The 458 was already a car that was devastatingly fast on the public road. Heck, a 430 can get you into serious trouble. Simply put, nobody actually needs the level of performance that this can deliver, but supercars have never really been about what you need, they're about what you want. I am constantly impressed by what they can do, regardless of whether I actually ever ask them to do it or not. However, what I really enjoy and appreciate about this engine is that it gives me so much so soon. I recently drove the Porsche Cayman GT4 RS, and much like the GT3, that's a car that only really starts to come alive at 5,000 RPM. And the fact is that by the time the engine is revving that high, even in second, you're already going pretty quickly. And that robs you of a lot of opportunity to enjoy the car at sensible speed. Here, in turbocharged guys in particular, and honestly, the 458 wasn't far behind, you've got so much mid-range, you can have a lot of fun, you can play with the car, you can work your way through the gears, get the experience, you're still driving a Ferrari, and not feel like you're missing out from all that much. Yes, of course, you can, on occasion, take it to the max, get it to the red line, and it's a hell of a lot of fun to do that. But you also don't feel the constant need to do that, which in many other cars, you would. As I'm about to come through an impossibly tight section, good time to talk about visibility. Here, it's pretty much the same as a 458. In other words, very good for a supercar. The last one that I drove, 458 that is, wasn't at all, but that was because it had the roll hoop installed, which essentially robs you of your rear visibility. This is perfectly fine. In fact, I can see on the uh, shot here, you can actually see through the rear a little bit. It's great, it's easy to place. You've got some nice pronounced haunches on the front and at all times you are reminded you're in something seriously, properly special. I love the fact the car has those big scoops on the side which appear in the wing mirror, that's lovely. And I must say, I was never quite sure about the styling of the 488. In particular, it's the front end I couldn't get on with because that little section at the front, the little splitter thing, it always looks badly fitted. It looks like it should be a little bit further down. It doesn't look like it's sat quite flush. It's not meant to be sat flush. It's meant to leave a little bit of a gap. That's an aerodynamic device. But in my mind, it just always looked like bad Italian build quality. However, in the flesh, it does look a bit better. And on the move, this thing has real shades of baby LaFerrari. In darker colours in particular, it really works. Black, blue and the like. But actually, even here, in your traditional Rosso Corsa, it's also pretty good looking. Anyway. A musical interlude. I feel like this is the first time I'm driving a 488, even though it isn't. The reason for that is simple. A couple of years ago, courtesy of Meridian Modena and Ferrari GB, I got to experience a 488. However, it was on the roads surrounding Meridian, in other words, the New Forest. And uh, unfortunately, though I love Meridian as a dealer, the roads around them are just not good for this kind of car. You've got a lethal combination of 40 mile an hour limits, old people doddering about, cattle grids and kamikaze ponies, meaning that anybody who even tries to drive quickly around there is a certified lunatic. As a result, I came away from that drive feeling like I'd been teased by the 488. I got just the tiniest taste of it, but not the full three courses. One of the things I felt about the car at the time was that it was overly stiff. The 458 is ludicrously comfortable, but I thought that this car was just a little bit too firm. Happily, I can now say I was wrong. The 488 is certainly, at all times, a little bit stiffer than the 458, but, in all honesty, that car did have a little bit of room to spare. It's certainly nowhere near as uncompromising as, say, a Lamborghini Huracan. This is a beautifully damped car. 
Next, another aspect of the 458 that just disappointed, the gearbox. Both have a seven-speed dual clutch, and this is simply an evolution of the one in the 458. However, in that car, it always felt like, though it was certainly competent, the gearbox was never exciting, and that was a shame. In auto mode, it certainly works. It's a big step on from the old single clutch boxes. However, that's really not what these are designed for. My issue with the 458 instead was, while it could do the low speed thing very well, when you came to press on, it just didn't excite. This, though, is definitely a big improvement. is one reason that you'll want to put this car into race mode. This 488 belongs to my good friend Steve, who's only just picked it up from Ferrari Colchester. I came along with him for the event because it was a pretty big deal. I've been good friends with him and his now wife Lane for a number of years, and as fellow car people, I've really enjoyed following them on their journey in both life and cars. When we met, he had a C63. In fact, it was one of the very first cars I was lent for a review that belonged to someone I didn't know all that well, so I owe Steve a lot. He put faith in me in the early days. And to see him join me on this journey of progression through cars has been absolutely amazing. This is his very first Ferrari, and I am incredibly proud of what he and Lane have achieved together. However, having experienced a number of Ferraris myself, I've also sort of taken the role of an older mentor, and I've been trying to teach him the things he should and shouldn't do with this. The number one thing I told him to not do was put the car into race mode until he had the right conditions, and he felt like he was ready for it. But I am going to, when I get back, tell him that today is a good day for race mode. This will, of course, come with a warning, because when you do twist that Manatino around from sport to race, one of the things that happens is the traction control gets backed off just a little bit. And from experience, I know that means if you put your foot down, the tail will kick out quite a bit more before the car tries to catch it. Provided you're ready for it, that's not an issue. However, one of the benefits of race mode is that the gearbox becomes even more exciting. Downshifts more rapid, upshifts a little more aggressive. This is so, so good. See what I mean? Ah, what a car, what a car. He himself said it's just about the first he's ever owned where you can't just go out and put your foot down and not really think about the consequences. He's absolutely right. Ah, it's amazing. Absolutely amazing, this thing. Next up in terms of dynamics and another area where the 458 just disappointed. Steering. That at low speeds, again, is fine, it's okay. Most Ferraris have a tendency to be just a little bit too light. And honestly, steering is one area where Ferrari are wildly inconsistent. You get in just about any Lotus, the steering will be good. Get in just about any Aston Martin, the steering will be good. Get in any McLaren, the steering will be excellent. But Ferrari, not the case. F355, my favorite car of all time, steering, Pants, absolutely rubbish. F430, steering, pants. 430 Scuderia, steering much better. 550, steering, amazing. F12, steering, very good. They just cannot make their mind up. But here, though I would say it's not quite as good as a McLaren, it's certainly a big step on from the 458. There's more waiting, more of the time. You've got a real sense of connection with the front of the car, and that gives you a lot more confidence. This is a helm that feels like it's connected to the front wheels. In the 458, it simply doesn't. And something of note for the 488, this is one of the last Ferraris to have hydraulic steering. Maybe that contributes. OK, so then, back in town, and time to talk about some perhaps mundane, but I think very important stuff. This car, as mentioned, has a number of competitors. Lamborghinis, McLarens, other Ferraris, and I think one of the areas where this does really well is the interior. 
in some ways a McLaren's is more driver focused there are certain touch points that are just better I love the unadorned wheel in a McLaren versus the uh, tech and button fest that you find in here I will confess I've kind of come around to Ferrari's way of thinking in terms of certain items like the indicators on the wheel however there are still other areas where other manufacturers do it better the paddles on a McLaren which are fixed to the back of the wheel not the column and are essentially one big paddle they're just better they just are I love the gear shift in a McLaren this is not bad but it just doesn't have that solidity that tactility of the McLaren a Lamborghini's I would say is similar to this maybe better maybe worse depending on the model visibility here is as mentioned already very good superior certainly to a Lamborghini and I would say equal to many a McLaren overall space though is certainly much better here than in any McLaren I've been in though in terms of footprint this is about the same as a 650 570 or a 720 inside it feels like it's about a foot wider and this is largely due to the fact that these don't have quite as pronounced a sill as the McLaren the downside is that when you talk about the convertible version the Ferrari comes with a serious penalty in terms of torsional rigidity it just isn't anywhere near as stiff and it suffers the F8 is one of the worst cars I've experienced for scuttle shake unforgivable really at the price point McLaren brilliant however if you're talking about a coupe it shouldn't be anywhere near as much of an issue storage space is also another area where these cars do quite well I'd say they're roughly equivalent to many a McLaren and certainly much better than any Lamborghini or Audi R8 the boot up the front is a decent size not quite as big as some older cars like the F430 but I think still more than enough for a nice weekend away provided you take soft bags fuel economy in just about any Ferrari is pretty tragic they don't even give you an economy meter because they know you'd rather be kept in the dark about about such things but expect high teens as an average that's another area where the McLaren is simply superior clawing back some points for the Ferrari as standard in the UK these all came with a four-year warranty so the latest examples will now only just be getting to the end of that and it can be extended up to 15 years by which time it largely covers just the engine and gearbox but it's still a nice peace of mind to have these cars also came with Ferrari's seven-year service plan so the first seven years of servicing regardless of how many miles you did were all free this particular car being a 2016 has still one left and that is pretty good once you're out of said servicing budget just under a thousand pounds for a minor and about 1500 pound for a major because many of them have spent a lot of time in the warranty scheme it's hard to tell really what goes wrong and how much it costs to fix but realistically I would say for the vast majority of people buying these at the prices they currently are you do want to get it with a Ferrari warranty it just makes sense this particular car is in what I would call a decent specification very representative really of what many of them are the classic Rosso Corsa paintwork over cream leather with red stitching and Bordeaux carpets it's essentially a spec twin of my F12 you had a choice of two different seats with these the comfort items as you see here or the buckets my preference would be for the buckets but not everybody gets on with them these are very comfortable nice they have electric adjustment memory and also heating but I just don't think they hug you in the way I'd like a Ferrari seat too suspension lift is another option this car has and one I would deem essential though for the most part you don't need it it is something you'd be very grateful for if you want to take this car on a long trip as I know Steve and Lane do the red seat belts in this do lift it you have the obligatory smattering of carbon throughout and it also has the fairly rare to see carbon engine bay which does look pretty good opening the engine cover or the bonnet of any Ferrari should always be a special experience and having that extra bit of carbon in the back I think seals the deal for this it's a glorious car and I think makes it a great specification for Stephen Lane's first Ferrari
let's talk price, shall we? Because that, I think, is, depending on your perspective, where the 488 will either fall apart or seal the deal. To get yourself into one of these, you're looking at, realistically, £150,000. And if you are coming from the perspective of another Ferrari, I think that makes these one of the best value cars out there. Because to get yourself into a 458, realistically, you are looking at 120 grand for the very bottom of the market. But if you want one from a Ferrari dealer with a bit of warranty on it, you're actually looking at £140,000. And for me, this is simply a better car. Regardless of price, it is just better. It's faster, I think in some ways better looking, though in others I appreciate not. And it is a newer car which comes with all the benefits of a slightly more mature platform, will have less owners, invariably less miles and the like, and you're going to have an easier time finding one with warranty, free servicing and all that good stuff. I know the turbocharged engine to many people is a real deal breaker, but honestly, having experienced it, it's a highlight of this car. You then combine that with the vastly superior steering and gearbox compared with the 458, and it's just a no-brainer. For me, this is a better car full stop. And the fact it's essentially the same money as a 458 is more or less a joke. I would have one of these all day long over that. But of course, there aren't just other Ferraris out there. We've also got to consider the likes of, say, a Lamborghini. And in that world, you'd have to compare this with a Huracan. For the 150 grand to get you in one of these, you could buy an early LP610. And though they're decent enough cars that have a glorious engine, that naturally aspirated V10, which in many ways is easily the equal of this, it just, as a package, doesn't work. Horrible thing to be in, horrible thing to spend any real time in. I just am not a fan. And the Lamborghini ownership experience, I can tell you, just isn't as good or as smooth as that in the Ferrari. The warranty only goes up to seven years, and for the kind of cars you're going to be able to pick up at this kind of price point, that will present a problem. Of course, the value alternative is going to be an Audi R8. It gives you essentially many of the same mechanicals as the Huracan. Will be a lot cheaper to maintain, to look after and everything else, but still has that fire-breathing V10, the same dual-clutch gearbox, and inside, actually, is a more livable thing. But it's an Audi, which I think to many people will automatically discount it. And that's a shame, because it's a great car, and for 120 grand, you could get an excellent example of an R8 V10 Plus, just before they installed the petrol particulate filter and made it quite a bit quieter. However, the real competitor for this is going to be a McLaren. No two ways about it. Though the Maserati may be tempting, it's a brand new car, and in reality, it's priced closer to, say, a second-hand F8 than it really is to one of these. The McLaren, though, that's interesting. You could take a 570, a 600 LT, a 12C, a 650, or even a 720 for the money you'd pay to get into one of these. If you're a dedicated hardcore track day fiend, 600 LT. What a car, amazing. You can batter that thing all day long and it will love you for it. Meanwhile, a 12C now is a fabulous thing, really growing into its looks, and you can pick one of those up for half the price of this. In Spider Guys, only really a tiny bit more, and if you just want something where you open the garage, go wow, and then when you put your foot down, do the same, the McLaren is an excellent choice. Hardly a slow car, even by modern standards, and I think a fabulous and criminally underrated one. You just can't argue with the value of it. Then the 650 at 100 grand, that I think is the real rival for this. A 720 is certainly faster, and you'd pay kind of similar money to get into one of these. There are a few cheaper ones about, but. 720 just wasn't built quite so well. In some ways, I think it's not quite the same car as the 650. Those really are my favorite of all McLarens, and an incredible combination of stunning supercar looks, incredible performance, sensational handling. The steering in the gearbox in a 650 might be just about superior to this, though the engine and the interior are not, and of course, a lot of people I know will be concerned about the McLaren ownership experience. But with the likes of independents such as Thorny Motorsport here in the UK, I'd say you shouldn't be too worried about owning one now. However, I think a lot of people will simply consider the Ferrari badge to be the one. And of course, it may simply be the case that you are elsewhere in the world and a McLaren dealership is just a bit too far away. In which case, if you can get your hands on a 488 for sensible money, I think they're an absolutely stunning car.
I'm very grateful to Steve for giving me this opportunity to revisit the car because after the first drive, I was left a little bit cold by this car. Now though, I'm anything but. The 488 GTB was one of my favorite Ferraris. Thanks for watching everyone. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.